And of course, by no one, I mean large corporations, pharmacies, and half of Congress. <laughs> Touchy subject. Speaking of Congress, <laughs> obviously global warming isn't real, because Oklahoma Senator James Info brought a snowball into Congress once, single-handedly disproving the 97% of researchers who say otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Revolutionary. <laughs> and it's no wonder he's one of the men responsible for our causes. Decreased state funding and powerful corporations. Initially, decreased state funding is largely to blame for schools accepting biased grants. The New York Times of January 22, 2016 points out, the average state is spending 20% less on public colleges than they were a decade ago. As that funding disappears faster than my high school prom date. <laughs> it's a joke, guys, I didn't have one. <laughs> Our research programs are quick to follow. Our education systems are becoming just like the students that attend them. Broke. Sad. And living off a diet that consists only of cheap beer and yellow starbursts. <laughs> Even though you hit rock bottom and your dinner consists of a single yellow starburst, they are figurative. No. Literally the worst. <laughs> Decreased state funding is the yellow starters that is ruining our education. Keep them from up. 
download and everything into the Dropbox account. The password is shh. Joseph von Littrow is a famous mathematician from the 18th century. He's most famous for creating what's called the Littrow projection, or in layman's terms for non-math majors, basically the 18th century version of math course. So you know, like the world's a circle, and so like drawing a straight line isn't always the most efficient. Joseph von Littrow was just some smart dude that figured out how to do that most efficiently. <laughs> However, what he's also famous for is something called the Intergalactic Space Communicator. This was his pet project. Now I know what you're probably thinking. Yeah, there was a guy back in the 1700s that was concerning himself with how he can be talking to aliens. His idea could basically be boiled down into dig a huge trench in the Sahara Desert, fill it full of kerosene, and then light it on fire. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> now Joseph von Littrow wasn't concerned with the consequences of the decision. In fact, his decision killed six people. He didn't think of that. But this idea of not considering the consequences of your actions is exemplified in our quotation given to you today. Written or spoken by Oscar Wilde. Nowadays, people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And what we can take this quotation to mean is that it's important, and what Oscar Wilde is warning us of, is the importance of understanding the full circumstance to a situation. We're gonna analyze this in two main ways. First, how we can avoid biases that can cloud our judgment. Or second, the dangers of focusing on the consequences of our decision. But first, it's important when we're trying to make decisions, like Joseph von Littrow, whether or not to dig a huge trench in the Sahara, to avoid the biases that come with making these decisions. And for this, we have two examples. First, we have Simone Bolivar. But for second, Gabe Newell. But first, Simone Bolivar is a famous South American revolutionary that tried to free South America from the colonial Spanish. Now, he's famous because he was successful overthrowing the Spanish Empire, which was way bigger than his army and anything he could ever dream of. The problem with Simón Bolívar early on was that he gave military positions to people that he liked, a form of nepotism. This was a bias in his judgment and almost cost him in his attempts to free South America. By avoiding these biases and getting rid of people that he simply saw as good because he liked them, this allowed him to be more successful. But second, we have the example of Gabe Newell. Now, Gabe Newell is an American entrepreneur that created Valve Corporation. Valve Corporation created a famous online product called Steam. Steam pretty much can be described as the iTunes of video games. <laughs> Basically, you can go on there and buy video games and download, download them to your computer, not unlike you download music on iTunes. Now, one of the problems with the internet is a problem of piracy. You know, computer engineers spend all this money to make software, but people just steal it online on sites like the Pirate Bay. However, Gabe Newell avoided the bias of blaming other people and instead put the blame solely on his company and things that he could control. Going so far as to say, piracy, online piracy, is a customer service issue, not a consumer issue. Gabe Newell avoided the biases of blaming other people. For that, he created one of the most successful softwares online to date. But additionally, it's important that we analyze the dangers of the consequences of our decisions. Now, if I was really concerned with the consequences, I wouldn't just crumple up my note card and just throw it over there. <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> the dangers of looking at the consequences of your decisions oftentimes is that you don't make decisions because you're coming up with what's going to happen. Like, read your note card because you crumpled it up and threw it across the room. <laughs> and for this, we have two examples. First, Ted Turner, or second, uh, Kevin Cotter. But first, Ted Turner is a famous uh, founder of CNN. Ted Turner created the online news network, which completely, or not online news network, 24-hour news network. The internet was not around back in 1980. It's not nearly as much. The 24-hour news network went completely against the grain. And because of this, there was a very high chance that he could fail. If Ted Turner got hung up on this, we wouldn't have CNN or Donald Trump to rail against every single day. <laughs> but additionally, beyond not being able to read my card, 
Kevin Carter is another example of someone that was not concerned about the consequences of his decision. He was a person who was an Arizona man who tried to write a book after getting divorced by his wife. Now, instead of being hung up with the consequences of the fact that his wife probably isn't liking that she's outing him, or he's outing her, he decided to write this book and got on Good Morning America because of it. So these two people are examples of people that were not necessarily concerned with their decisions before they made them. So when we return to our quotation by Oscar Wilde, which is up here, <laughs> nowadays, people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. What we took this to mean is that it's important to understand the full context of a situation by analyzing it in two ways. First, how we can avoid biases, and second, avoiding, the, avoiding being hung up on the consequences of our decisions. Jekyll and Hyde 
had nothing on my daddy. Last week, the queen took me and Princess P to the park. It was awesome! <laughs> we swung on swings, we climbed on the jungle gym. She dropped me off the jungle gym. <laughs> because she thought I could hold on. Humans. <laughs> and when we finished brushing the witches out of our skirt, the queen took the princess by the hand and we walked home. But when we got to the apartment, the door was left cracked open. The queen went stiff as we slowly crept in. The TV was blaring. The king was drunk again. He owned her. The first time he hit her, I felt a loose tooth up. Temporary nightmare. The second time he hit her, he cried himself to sleep. And that was nice. That was rough. The third time he hit her, he counted her scars and whispered, never again, baby, never again. When I die without you, turn to, I'll kill you if you ever leave me. I bristle like a hound in heat, such rage in me screeching run. As he jammed the steel burning barrel into my breath bone. My last thought, you won't believe this. My last thought, you really won't believe this. My last thought was, wow, he must really the king jumped up and screamed, where have you been? Like he forgot he kissed us goodbye before we left for the park. The queen said with better breath, princess, why don't you take PJ to your room? The king screamed, no, she needs to hear your lies. She didn't lie, I want to say, but I'm a doll. I want to say, look, there are still wood chips in my skirt, but I'm a doll. I want to say, don't do anything in front of the princess, but I'm a doll. The king stepped forward and the princess brought me as she ran to her room. As he brought the remote down across the prince, the queen's face, she screamed out and the princess started to sob. She stumbled through the hallway as he slowly crept off to her, stepping on me and tripping to the ground. It angered him so much that he grabbed me by the leg and tossed me into the princess's room. Tears falling down the face. Mom, are you fine? Mom. Mom. Mom, are you fine? Mom. Mom. Mom, are you fine? Mom, she will not die because he says so. Time is slow to heal. The wounds gape open for years. His fist and thirst for blood go unseen, even by her, but she will not die for anyone. From them come a treasure, a solitary lily. She protects this delicate flower with her life. She waters and feeds it daily. She sings to it and blesses it as the night passes. His anger fades each day, witnessing the flower's beauty. She had always dreamed this anger would be removed. It seemed there was no hope. She is still not sure. She was fed up with this hate for her. She was flooded with emotion and bleeding from every blow. Her soul was no longer healthy. She had none left for herself. Her blood made the soul strong in time fast. She appreciated the sun and praised the rain. And when the lily came back as she had hoped, she had a home that she would have never had before. And she was thankful. My mother speaks with the door. A bookcase behind it and a shelf behind that. She stays up till 3 a.m. singing and praying to her something to believe in peace. She's still scared of my father even though he's married and lives two hours away, far isn't far enough. He still touches her and I still manages to take her breath away. I moved to another state at 18 thinking, I'm a better daughter if I allow her the opportunity to forget. Still maneuvering like a six-year-old, still trying to save my mama. 
Domestic violence happened before Chris Brown. It happens after Chris Brown. Any of us could be Rihanna. So 1-800-799. Seven, two, three, three. As I lay limp on the floor, I see her tears streaming down the princess's face. I want to reach out, but I am a doll. Dear applicant of ethnic origin, you have been accepted to the my prestigious university. We saw your face and loved it. <coughs> However, there are a few things you should know. They say I'm not the average black girl. They say I'm not the average black girl because I'm so well spoken, poised, full of etiquette, and white man's help. The admissions office has heard your story a thousand times. Props, write about an experience indicative to your world. In Oreo is a word used by blacks in an attempt to strip one another of their blackness. I gave myself a, um, a thorough self-evaluation and listed all the reasons why I would be called an Oreo. I speak proper English. I'm more educated. I love to read. I grew up in a fairly decent neighborhood and um, I sound white. Hi, my name is, I'm a victim of suburban culture. Dealers have just still like my favorite idol and they also will always like be my favorite TV show. And I probably say the word like way more than necessary. All the traits associated with the <coughs> Caucasian females of the United States. You know, I remember my ex's mother telling me I didn't know how I was going to respond when you brought a black girl, but uh, I like you because you sound so white. Because when did me talking right equate me talking white? 